welcome uh, everybody at this, uh, I think we should call it a special edition of Radboud Reflects. We usually don't uh, invite speakers in the afternoon, but as today's uh, speaker is doing nine talks in three days, um, this was the only moment she could make it and come to Nijmegen. So we're very happy uh, to have, have Kate Raworth here this afternoon. Um, you probably all heard about her book, Donut Economics. Maybe you have read it. Maybe you've seen the Tegelicht uh, episode uh, about Donut Economics. So today, this afternoon, she will tell us a bit more about it. Um, so why do we need this new framework for discussing social and planetary boundaries? Uh, why does the economic science need to change and what does she propose? So she'll give a lecture of about 45 minutes. And afterwards, we've invited uh, Ivan Boldidev. He is a, a philosopher and an historian of uh, economics. Um, he's assistant professor of economic theory and policy at the Radboud Un uh, Universiteit, and we've invited him to reflect some more on her uh, ideas to really, yeah, that's what we do, we reflect some more at Radboud Reflects. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so my name is Lisa Duland, I'm a program manager at Radboud Reflex. I will chair the discussion. Uh, I will also make sure that you have time, about 20 minutes, I think, at the end for, for questions. Um, so that's the program for today. Uh, give a warm welcome to Kate Rayworth. Hello. And thank you very much, Lisa, for such a lovely introduction. I'm so delighted to be here. And I want to first figure out why you're here. So if you've come for the donuts, I'm sorry, it's just a concept. But if you come for the economics, let's figure out who in this room has ever studied economics in any form, high school, university, PhD? Great, lots of people. Who in this room cannot believe, had never studied economics, can't believe you've come to a talk with the word economics in the title? This really wouldn't, oh, nobody. There's somebody, come on. A few, okay, a few honest folk here, great. I hope we can make this worth it for everybody. Uh, let me tell you why I'm here. Oh, there's a donut. So in the late 1980s, I went off to university to study economics. There's me with my first textbook, very excitedly reading a book by Lipsy called Positive Economics. Positive, not meaning thumbs up economics, but meaning value-free economics. It's not normative, it's positive. I should have been suspicious from the beginning that such a thing existed. But I was very excited because I had grown up in the 1980s seeing a famine in Ethiopia, a hole in the ozone layer, learning, out, learning about climate change, the greenhouse gas effect, and I wanted to help change this. So I thought if I learn economics, the mother tongue of public policy, this will equip me. But I found after four years of study that I was frustrated by what I was being taught because the issues I cared most about were at the margins of the theory, not at the centre even though I believe they are the most important issues of our day. So I didn't stay on to do a PhD. I wanted to immerse myself instead in the real world economy. I spent three years, I'm gonna make friends with this clicker. No, yes, I spent three years working in the villages of Zanzibar with barefoot entrepreneurs. I spent four years at the United Nations uh, Human Development Report, writing the report that reframes development from economic development to human development. I spent over a decade te uh, working at Oxfam on labor rights in, climate, in, in global supply chains, on climate change and why this is an issue of social justice. And then I became a mother of twins and I began to understand gender politics in a completely new way. And, I, and then I look back and I realized, well, every career story at one level, it's just a series of bad haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> You have your own photos, you may laugh, but you have your own. But it's also a story of what were you searching for? And I realized I'd spent about 20 years of my career trying to make visible the things that were left invisible in mainstream economics, from the unpaid work of women, from exploitation of workers at the end of global supply chains, from the social injustice impacts of climate change. And I thought, I don't want to spend the next 
several decades carrying on in this vein. I want to be part of a movement that rewrites economics and puts these issues at the heart of the human quest for well-being. So I left my job at Oxfam. I started teaching at the Environmental Change Institute, where I still teach today in Oxford. But I immersed myself in all the economic theory I had never been taught. Feminists, ecological, complexity, institutional, behavioral economics. And I wrote a book that brought these together and said, when you start here, in series that are seen at the fringe, you can begin to put together a completely new story of economics. So let me start with this donut, the one donut in the world that actually turns out to be good for us. Because I've learned that pictures are powerful. And I want to introduce you to a picture that I offer as a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century. So imagine humanity's use of resources radiating out from the middle of the picture, so that the hole in the middle is a place where people are left falling short without the resources that they need for healthcare, education, food, water, housing, energy, mobility. And these 12 I have crowdsourced from the world's governments. They are all drawn from the Sustainable Development Goals. So all the governments of the world have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to these. We want to leave nobody in that hole, get everybody over the social foundation into the donut. But, and this is a big but, we cannot collectively overshoot the outer ring, the ecological ceiling, because there we begin to tip our planet out of balance with our pressure on resources. We cause climate change, we acidify the oceans, create a hole in the ozone layer, create catastrophic levels of biodiversity loss and ecosystem breakdown. And these nine around the outside, these are the nine planetary boundaries that Earth system scientists a decade ago first drew up and recognized that these are nine critical life-supporting systems that keep our planet Earth the only one we know of, the only one on which there is life, the only one that acts as a home sweet home for humanity. These keep our planet in the balance that has enabled humanity to thrive and flourish. So the challenge when you put these together is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. If I offer you that as a compass, well, you want to know where the needles are pointing, where are we now? And it's not an easy picture to look at because all of that red in the middle shows you the extent to which people are falling short. You've got food, for example, there at the top. That red wedge goes 11% of the way to the middle of the circle because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. We want to eliminate all of the red around the edges here. You can see on every one of these social dimensions, there are people in countries, rich and poor, who cannot meet their most essential needs. And yet, while that deprivation exists, we've already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries on climate change, on biodiversity loss, excessive fertilizer use, and excessive land conversion. And we don't even know globally where we are on air pollution and chemical pollution. They're not even measured. So this is the state of humanity and our planetary home in these early days of the 21st century. This is our selfie. And we're the first generation to see it. It's appropriate, we're the first generation to go around taking selfies all the time. And here is our collective selfie. No economists of last century saw this picture. So why would we imagine that their theories were up to taking on the challenges that it presents us? I believe we need to come up with theories of our own that actually equip us to take this on. I've boiled this down, well, researchers at the University of Leeds have taken the donut concept and nationalized it for over 150 countries. And I picked just two that both have a population of 17 million people yourselves and Zambia. So in this diagram, you want to fill the central circle in blue, the way they've done it. You want to get blue all the way to the edges. So you can see that the Netherlands, on a very low global scale, is meeting a basic level of social provisioning, but has also massively overshot that biophysical ceiling. Far too much green on the outside, on all but one of those ecological dimensions. On far too, at the top, phosphorus and nitrogen, that's fertilizer use, carbon emissions, a material footprint, because this probably wasn't made in the Netherlands, but it has a footprint on the world of where it came from, probably China, and ecological footprint. So these measures show us 
the impacts of our country. Zambia, of course, is in the opposite situation from the Netherlands, barely touching those planetary boundaries, but still falling very far short on meeting the needs of its people. So both countries have a common objective to come into the donut, but both, of course, with a very, very different path, a very different transformationally journey ahead. I believe if we're going to do this, we need to change the conversations in our parliaments about what the economy is and what it's for and how it works and what success is. We need to change the conversations in boardrooms, in the media. And if we're going to change that, I think we need to go back to where economic conversations begin, in universities. Because it's in departments of economics that the story begins. So many people in this room have studied economics. I'm going to bet very few of you are going to go on to become an economics professor. Most people take that education, that mindset, and then go off and become a lawyer, uh, a financial specialist, um, a member of parliament, a community activist, a journalist, and we take what we know with us and this becomes the narrative that is the public narrative of economics that runs business, that runs parliament, that runs the media. So what's taught in universities, especially the first course, to my mind, is the most important. And I want to take us on a journey to recognise that today, students around the world are asking for a new curriculum. This is the Rethinking Economics movement that has popped up in over 20 countries internationally because students realise that the curriculum they're being taught today does not equip them for the challenges they know lie ahead. If they're going to become the policymakers of 2050, they need to be taught a curriculum that prepares them for 2050. And I believe the curriculum that's taught in many universities worldwide is still based on the textbooks of 1950, based in turn on theories dreamt up in the 1850s. And this is turning into a disaster. Let's zoom in again. Economic students in the Netherlands, Rethink Economics Netherlands, have said society is facing huge challenges. Economics plays a key role. It's at the forefront of societal change in the role of journalists, politicians and managers. We experience that Dutch economics education does not at all prepare students for these future leading roles. Now, of course, I, I can't speak to any one university, so I'm, and I'm crossing the Netherlands, showing the research that the students did themselves. But let's look at this table. They looked at all the economic curriculums on offer in the universities and found that over three quarters of it comes under what is termed neoclassical economics. That's one way of looking at and understanding economics. And below the line, game theory, experimental economics, political economy, um, post-Keynesian, ecological economics, complexity economics, feminist economics, all below that line, a small part of what's taught. And the students are asking to be given far more attention to a diverse range of ideas. I want to go back to where some of the ideas that are taught come from. And these are the faces of many of the founding fathers of economics, from Paul Samuelson, Keynes, Kuznets, Mill, Friedman, Adam Smith. I'm sure here in the Netherlands you could add more faces to this page, but they'd still all have a few things in common. They'd all be men. They'd all be white. And these ones particularly, who I think have shaped the international narrative, are men from often English-speaking, and from what I call empire countries, and I, I count you folks amongst the empire countries, countries that had colonies, where we, and you look, I'm a British person, I mean, really, the, the, the heart of the colony empire mentality, expansive, taking over the possibility of other lands. And I think these features shape what people see and what they don't see, what we put at the centre of thinking and what we leave in the margins. And I think it has consequences for the theories that we are all taught. I think there are a group of ideas, of little diagrams that are so innocent, so innocent on the page, but deeply shape the way we think about the economy. And they slip into our minds wordlessly, but they sit here in the visual cortex, which is at the back of your head. And they sit there for decades, shaping what we see and what we don't see, what's central and what's marginal. But they answer some of the most fundamental questions in economics, like what is the economy and what is it for and how does it work and who are we and I want to take you on a whirlwind tour of what I think have been some of the fundamental answers given to this in the mainstream economic mindset and the consequences 
and then look at an alternative way of looking at the economy today, one that I think does prepare us for the 21st century. So this is going to be our guide. This is Paul Samuelson, and he was teaching economics at MIT in the US in the 1950s. He was a brilliant economist and deeply influential in his day. And he knew that, yes, economists get points by publishing in the top journals, but the real influence lies in shaping the minds of the students. As he wrote, I don't care who writes a nation's laws or crafts its advanced treaties, so long as I can write the economics textbooks. And then the best bit. The first lick is the privileged one, impinging on the beginner's tabula rasa, at its most impressionable state. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Samuelson thinks your mind is a blank slate and he wants to lick it. <laughs> and of course he has, he's licked all of our minds because the diagrams he drew, he put in his seminal textbook published 70 years ago this year, Economics. These diagrams have shaped the way that diagrams have been drawn ever since. So, he was teaching engineers at MIT, and they had to study just a little bit of economics on the side. And his textbook was, again, it was the 101 course for those studying a bit of economics on the side. So when he drew a picture of the whole economy, he wanted to make it easy for the engineering students. He used a metaphor that would make sense to them. He drew it as a set of radiator pipes with water literally circling through those chambers between business and public, we would call public households and the, even with a pump at the top for pumping more water in. So the water goes round and round. It was an important insight, as every one of these diagrams shows, that there's a circularity that when people are paid wages, they then have spending power to buy more things, and companies then have the purchasing power to hire more people and pay more wages. And there's a circular flow. But this diagram has changed only a little bit in the last 70 years. It is still essentially the biggest picture of the economy that mainstream economics offers to its students. It looks more like this now, the circular flow of income. We've got households and business in the essential market relationship. Households provide labour and capital. In return, they get wages and profit. And with that money, they can do consumer spending and they get goods and services. So the resources go round and round and the money goes round and round. Yes, there are some leakages off that. In the diagram, we hear that not all money is spent on consumer goods. Some of it is saved into banks, and then banks can invest that. Except that's actually not how banks work. Banks create money, but I'm, I'm not even going to go there today because there's bigger fish to fry. Some of it apparently goes off as taxes for governments, and then governments have money to spend. But that's also not the only way that governments raise money. So there's some really important simplifications going on in this diagram. Some of it goes for imports, but more comes back in through exports. The point is, the diagram is circular, it's closed, it's self-contained. And of course, what these arrows track is money, the flows of money. This is actually the, the fundamental framework used to measure national income. It underpins national income accounting but it's still the biggest diagram of the whole economy that is on offer in mainstream economics today. And oh, the blank spaces. This picture is absolutely silent on the living world. It makes no mention of the energy and matter drawn in and the materials and waste spewed out. It makes no mention of the unpaid caring work of parents, the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping that goes into raising children and making that labour fresh and ready for work every day. And it makes no mention of the commons, where people come together, not through the market, not through the state, but as a community, an association, a cooperative, and organise and co-create things they value. These are three of the most fundamental sources of our well-being, the living world, unpaid care, and cooperation. If they're missing from the biggest picture we have at the beginning of the 21st century, this does not serve us well. What about who we are? Well, this story goes back to Adam Smith. And Smith actually had a nuanced understanding of humanity. He knew that markets, well, self-interest was important for making markets work, but that our interest in others was essential for making society work. And he championed our sense of generosity, our public spirit and sense of justice. The trouble is this was too nuanced a view to fit into the models that became popular at the heart of economics. And so later economists like John Stuart Mill came along and did something not very helpful. He narrowed it down. He said political economy 
does not treat the whole of man's nature nor the whole of his conduct in society. It sees him as a being who desires to possess wealth. Right there, he narrowed us down to self-interest. And that underpins the character that was then built of humanity at the heart of the models, rational economic man. Since I believe in the power of pictures, and I notice he never actually gets drawn in the textbooks, I decided to do his portrait. He'd have to look a bit like that. He'd be a man, and he'd be standing alone, with money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. He hates work, he loves luxury, and he knows the price of everything. And the trouble with him is that when we look at him and we're told that he is like us, we actually become more like him. Economic students, as they go from year one to year two to year three and learn more about this character, they say over time they more value self-interest and competition over collaboration and altruism. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. It's a huge responsibility for any academic discipline that claims to tell us who we are because it changes us. We begin to mirror the very model that we've made for ourselves. What about how the economy works? Isaac Newton will never be forgotten because he discovered the physical laws of motion and he invented physics as it was, you know, he made physics the great science in the 17th century. So when economists wanted to show that economics was a science as reputable as physics, they began to draw their diagrams in the style of Newton. His William Stanley Jevons drawing his first diagrams. And you can see it mimicking the very style of Isaac Newton. And this diagram is actually the first diagram that students still learn today. It's supply and demand. Underpinning that analogy he made, he and Valras in Switzerland said, just as gravity pulls a moving object to rest, so prices pull markets into equilibrium. And they wanted to show the connection between the new science of economics and the established science of physics. Of course, the problem is it's the wrong kind of science because the economy behaves in a very different way from a falling apple. But the real problems, I think, emerge that when we have supply and demand at the heart of our thinking, the first diagram students almost learn everywhere in the world. This centralizes the market in our thinking and things that fall outside the market are known as externalities. The consequence is that in studying economics, I found if I wanted to talk about climate change, chemical pollution, air pollution, biodiversity loss. I was, I was offered two words in all of my studies. I was told, well, yes, these are environmental externalities. And the best picture I found for depicting the living world in economics, how do we show the living world in economics? Well, it shows up as this gap between two lines, the gap between the private cost of supply and the social cost of supply. Given all that we know in the 21st century, about our dependence, our dependence on this living planet. It cannot go well if we continue to refer to the degradation of our planetary home as an externality, and we continue to show it only as a gap between a pair of lines. But also, the desire to show that economics follows laws of motion, like physics, led economists to try to find the economic laws of motion. This is the Kuznets curve, uh, first drawn in the 1950s by brilliant economist Simon Kuznets, who with a little bit of data thought that he saw a pattern that as a, over time as economies get richer, first inequality increases, but then it decreases. He couldn't understand the pattern, but it became, once the picture is drawn, it became a mantra, growth will even things up again. So it actually justified for many decades trickle-down economics, austerity economics. It was P Thomas Piketty who came along and looked at this data and said, Kuznets was right, this is what he saw. But he was measuring the data before war and after war. It was a particular moment in history and war destroys the capital of the wealthy. And post-war governments invested in health, education and housing. So it was war and government intervention that bent that curve down, not the inherent workings of the market. But the mantra, the idea that growth will even things up again, lives on in many economies. Over here, the environmental Kuznets curve, same story. It seems to be that over time, as countries get richer, first pollution will increase, but don't worry, because as we get richer, things will clean up again. Like a well-trained child, growth will clean up after itself. But as any parent knows, it won't. And it may look true for local pollutants, but when we take account of global pollutants, carbon emissions, material footprint, that curve does not automatically bend down. 
But I think they gave great justification to the deepest belief about the direction of economic progress, which is an ever-rising line of growth. Again, poor Simon Kuznets was there at the beginning. He was asked by US Congress to come up with a single number to measure the output of the American economy, and he did. It's what we now know as national income or GDP. But he said, this number could scarcely be used to measure the welfare of a nation. Why? Well, he said, it doesn't include the unpaid caring work of parents. It doesn't include the value of goods created by the community. And it's just a flow measure. It doesn't tell us about how we're transforming the stocks of resources in order to generate that. He saw the whole story from the beginning. But politicians ended up tucking those caveats aside because the temptations of one single number were so great. And so now we have economies that have become structurally dependent upon unending growth. So that even the richest economies in the world, like yours and mine and the US and Canada and Australia, believe that the solution to all their economic ills lies in more growth, unending. Well, when I show you all these diagrams and you see the caveats, the flaws, the blind spots, the historical temporality of them, it's easy to see the holes, but they actually create a very powerful basis for mindset that I think has underpinned a lot of neoclassical economic thinking and policy making. So they translate into easy policies that have not favoured the world for a long time. I think they drive us towards this situation where millions of people fall short on basic needs. We have extreme levels of inequality opening up between the 1% and the rest of the world. And we've already pushed ourselves over planetary boundaries. I don't think these ideas take us towards a future where we can turn this story around. So at this point, I turn back to one of the greats of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, who in the 1930s said, economics is the science of thinking in terms of models. Yes, joined to the art of choosing models which are relevant to the contemporary world. And I think it's the second half of this that we most need right now. Ours is an era, I believe, in which we need to look afresh at the circumstances, re-understand our relationship to the world and choose models that are relevant to the contemporary world and that will equip today's students to be effective policymakers of the future. So let me give you a whirlwind tour of what I think is the beginnings of that art of new models relevant for the contemporary world. This is partly where the story of writing my book came in, when I found this table produced by the, the Dutch students, I was really fascinated because essentially what my book does is start in the bottom half of the table. It starts with ecological economics and feminist and institutional and complexity and behavioural economics. The ones that get left in the margins of the syllabus but puts them central and says, if you bring these together, we actually start to get an alternative and effective new way of looking at the world. So... Let me give you, a, uh, and of course I believe in the power of pictures, so I've written new pictures to replace the old ones, something new to go in the visual cortex. I start economics not with supply and demand, not with the market, but with the question, what is the economy for? Let's talk about purpose. Because if we don't have the conversation about what the economy is for, how on earth do we know what success looks like? And so for me, I offer this donut as humanity's 21st century challenge. The purpose of our 21st century economy should be to meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And if you want to disagree, well, that's fantastic because now we're having a conversation and we're actually delving into what the economy is for. But unless we have that conversation, how can we ever know what success looks like and how can we measure it? Second, what would be the first diagram of the economy that I'd actually show? Not supply and demand, but I would show the biggest one. So removing supply and demand, not starting with a circular flow, I start here. I call this the embedded economy diagram. And if you know ecological economics or feminist economics or commons theory, you'll see that they're all together here. So we've got the economy. It's embedded in society and the social, cultural, political institutions. Embedded in the living world, drawing in energy and matter, spewing out waste and pollution, and bathed in this river of solar energy. So from day one, we can ask the central question of ecological economics. How big can the through flow of energy and matter be through our economy before we begin to kick ourselves out of balance? But then look inside the economy itself. It's not just the market and the state. That was a 20th century ideological boxing match. 
And in that boxing match, we lost sight of two other fundamental sources of provisioning for our wants and needs. There's the household where we all begin every day, the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, raising children, caring for our partners, ourselves, our parents, an essential source of well-being that underpins all market activity. And then there's the commons where people come together, whether it's to create a neighborhood garden on the corner of the block or to write Wikipedia and, and Linux on the World Wide Web. If we start with those rich forms of provisioning, we can see they each have unique qualities. I know I wouldn't want to live in an economy that lacked any one of them. And we need new questions today about what is the right balance between these forms of provisioning and the particular role of the state in terms of making space to ensure all of them can work as effectively as they can. And then there's finance in the middle. Finance should be a service. You remember the days we talked about financial services as if finance was actually in service, not to itself, but to the economy, in service to human well-being. What would that look like? I think a very different form of finance than the one we have today. What about who we are? We're so much more interesting than rational economic man. Yes, of course we can be self-interested, but we are also socially reciprocating. We, Homo sapiens, are the most social of all the mammals. And that's an essential part of our quality. We thrive in social groups. We don't have fixed preferences, as the, the economic theories like to assume. Actually, we have very fluid values. Let me give you an example. If I divided this audience, well, I'd give all of you a survey to fill in about your values and preferences. But then in this half of the room, the front page says, this is a consumer reaction study. Please fill in about your values and preferences. But over here it says, this is a citizen reaction study. Please fill in your values and preferences. The research on this shows that you'd fill it in differently. Because here I've activated the consumer. And here I've activated the citizen. And even the name by which we are called changes how we respond. We're so fluid and responsive to the different kinds of identities that we have in the economy. Rather than work hating, I actually think people are purpose seeking. And those are the lucky ones for whom work and purpose come together. And rather than dominant over nature at the pinnacle of human creation, we are embedded in the web of life and need to embrace that understanding rapidly. How about how the economy works? Newtonian thinking put equilibrium at the heart of the models. I think it's smarter to start with complexity. And these two loops help us understand complexity. If you, if you never got that joke about why did the chicken cross the road, it's actually because he wanted to teach you systems thinking. So over here, we've got the reinforcing feedback loop where the idea of reinforcing feedback is the more you have, the more you get. So the more eggs you have, the more chickens you get, and the more chickens that you have, the more eggs you get. And anything in life that spirals up or spirals down is dominated by reinforcing feedback. But then over here, we've got the balancing feedback loop. The more you have, the less you get back. So the more chickens you have, the more try to cross the road. And the more that try to cross the road, sadly, the fewer make it back. And our bodies are dominated by balancing feedback. When I talk about economics, I get excited, I get hot, and my body starts to try and sweat to cool me down. When I get cold, I shiver, and I warm up again. And all of us, by incredible design, have just about the same body temperature because our bodies are constantly balancing us. But most of the fascinating patterns in life, from the way our bodies work, to the rise and fall of stock markets, to the boom and bust of, of uh, finance, to the, the rise of the 1%, to the collapse of ecosystems, can be understood through the interaction of these feedback loops. And after the financial crisis, many people turned to the writings of Hyman Minsky, whose work on financial instability puts balancing and reinforcing feedback and, and this uh, complexity at the heart of his analysis. If the economy is complex, and that's a smart place to start, then we can't control it, but we can shape it and steward it in design interventions. And to me, then, design becomes incredibly important. We can't assume that growth will eventually even things up again, because it doesn't. I believe we need to create economies that are distributive by design. And we can't assume that growth will clean up after itself, because it won't. I believe we need to create economies that are regenerative by design. Let me tell you a little bit about each of those. 
So distributive by design would be an economy that pre-distributes the sources of wealth creation rather than continually redistributing income in a very unequal society. There are opportunities to pre-distribute wealth, pre-distributing it through investments in health and education. That's been made by many states, recognizing that the fundamental wealth of the individual lies in their health and education, but also through energy, through information systems, renewable energy, which is distributed, information through the internet, through the ownership of land and housing and the ownership of enterprise. Regenerative design, through the middle of this diagram, we've got the degenerative linear 20th century economy, where we take us materials, we make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and then throw it away. And that pushes us over planetary boundaries. So we need to bend those arrows around and create a circular or cyclical or cradle to cradle economy where waste from one process becomes food for another. An economy that runs on sunlight and wind and waves. An economy that's modular by design and where resources are never used up, but are used again and again. Let me show you a few examples of these ideas actually being put into practice. In the sphere of housing, in Argentina and Chile, the architect Alejandro Aravena realized that many people would never be able to afford to buy a house. They just wouldn't have the money. So he thought, well, perhaps they could buy half a house. So he started to build half houses with all the heating and plumbing and electricity needed. And then when people had saved up enough money, maybe some years or decade later, they could fill the rest in. And his designs have now been built across those parts of Latin America, making housing much more affordable to people who otherwise would never be able to afford a home. In the sphere of enterprise, in the Rust Belt of the United States, where many industries closed down and moved overseas to China and Asia looking for lower wages, the workers left behind, particularly in the African-American community, came together and created cooperatives. And this is a laundry co-op, there's a solar panel installation cooperatives, worker-owner enterprise, where the choices are made by the workers themselves and the value is retained there, rather than being siphoned off increasingly in many countries to shareholders whose, whose dividend rates have risen as the wage bill has fallen. Um, energy installation, here's a solar panel going onto the roof of a house in Kathmandu, but in parts of Germany, they're built in just as the roofing tiles a solar power energy station on the roof of every home. This is distributive energy ownership. It can be done through wind power owned by communities or solar power owned by individuals. But the energy system is distributed in a way that it never has been before in human history. And this is an amazing opportunity. And then information. This is a fab lab or a maker space in the United States where citizens can come and use access to the internet, to the creative commons, open source data and software, 3D printers to be part of a globally distributed network of a knowledge commons and shared idea creation. Not just in the US, this is in Lome in Togo, bringing the capacity to create a computer through the open source knowledge network far faster than the private sector is doing. So these are some ideas of regenerative and distributive design. And I believe these design principles are going to be essential for bringing humanity into the donut, reducing inequality within and between countries, but also bringing us back within planetary boundaries. So where does that leave us on growth? Because I believe today we have economies that need to grow whether or not that makes us thrive. Growth has been designed into their institutions. They are financially, politically, and socially dependent upon unending growth. Financially, because financial markets seek in the companies in which they own shares, they want to see uh, growing profit, growing sales, and growing market share every quarter. Because money is created by commercial banks as debt that bears interest, which therefore must be repaid with more. So, Growth is written into many of the design of today's financial instruments that we have. We're politically addicted to growth. No, no, no government wants to lose their place in the G20 family photo. But if your economy stops growing while the rest keep going, well, you'll be booted out by Nigeria or Malaysia or Vietnam. So there's an international coordination challenge here. Everyone must keep growing to keep up with everybody else who must keep growing to keep a place at the geopolitical table of power. Governments, of course, also want to see growth because it's written into our assumption of how we fund pensions, how we fund the welfare system. 
It's written in as an un- ongoing assumption. So when it doesn't come, it's a disaster. But can we imagine new ways of creating economies that don't depend on unending growth? And I think we're socially addicted to growth because after a century of mass consumer propaganda that told us that we transform ourselves every time we buy something more, this has been written into culture that you know the best thing to do at the weekend is to go shopping. It's a lot of psychological undoing that needs to be unpicked there. Hire the best psychologists, not for the advertising industry, but for the advertising industry. How on earth do we do that? The reason I take on this challenge is because when you look to nature, who's been thriving for nearly four billion years, nothing in nature grows forever. This is nature's growth curve. From a a tree to your children's feet, things in nature grow. It's a wonderful, healthy phase of life. But then they grow up and they mature. And it's only by maturing that they can then thrive for a very long time. And things that try to grow forever within a healthy living system, well, in our own bodies, we would call that cancer. And we know that that does not go well. And we stop it as soon as we can. So why would we imagine that our economies will be the one system that can buck nature's trend and succeed by growing forever within a healthy living system of society and the living planet. I believe the 21st century existential economic challenge is to create economies that enable us to thrive, whether or not they grow. And it's far easier said than done. But if we are going to transform our economies so that they meet the needs of all, within the means of the planet, so that they are distributive and regenerative by design, we can no longer be driven by the need for ever-rising GDP. How do we make that transformation happen? I don't have the answer, but I have the question. So let me pull back and say I believe that this is the beginnings, the visual beginnings of a 21st century story of economics, and I really look forward to the conversation that Ivan and I are going to have and the discussion we can have Please challenge me, question me, because this is teamwork. And I think we've only just begun to build the 21st century way of thinking like a 21st century economist. Oh, one of the pleasures that I had when I finished writing the book was to stand back and reflect on who had really influenced the ideas at the heart of my book. And I was so pleased to realize that many of the people were women. And they weren't just writing about unpaid caring work. This is Donella Meadows, the mother of systems thinking, Mariana Mazzucato is a leading economist today, thinking, rethinking the role of the state in relation to the market. Janine Benyus, a brilliant thinker on biomimicry and regenerative design. And Eleanor Ostrom here, the only woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics for her work on the commons. But also, people who did not grow up in colonial centers of power, they actually grew up in the colonized countries. Amartya Sen, the son of India, He didn't focus his career on markets and prices. He focused his career on human entitlements and the essential needs of people, whether or not they can afford their needs. Ha Jun Chang, born in South Korea when it was called a third world country, and yet saw his country become one of the richest in the world, he tells a very different story about trade in industrialization and power. So I think economics is enriched when our diversity of economists is enriched because we, none of us can see everything. And our personal experience changes what we put at the center and what we put at the periphery. What we see is central and what we can't notice. So economics only improves when the diversity of economists gets better. And, and of course, it is getting more diverse, which is a great thing. So let me leave it there and say, if you like the ideas of donut economics, I welcome you to watch the one minute videos. You can see they're playful and silly and fun. Economics has to be fun if we're going to widen the 21st century conversation. And there's an online discussion group talking about systems thinking, nurturing human nature, donuts for cities, donuts in teaching. Please join us there if you want to be part of using these ideas in practice. Let me stop there. And I really very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you go over here. Wow, so much uh, food for thought. Um, so we have about 20 minutes now. Um, I suggest we 
you discuss, uh, delve a bit more into your ideas that visualization is very important, that mm. pictures are of importance, have been of importance in economics, and you use them as well. Uh, so graphs, maybe, may, maybe get a bit into to characters uh, and how the stage is set. Um, also, if, should economists lead the way? That is, I think, I'm, I'm very interested, Ivan, in what you think about that, um, and how change how the change would come about. So I think those might be the main things. But first of all, um, so you, you, uh, you ended with highlighting the importance of the, the marginalized in a way. So people that are uh, not at the center of economics. And I'm wondering, Ivan, um, as an historian and philosopher of economics, um, do you agree and is this... Um, uh, is this something yeah, that is happening really in, in the, the science of economics too? So maybe you could reflect on that first. Yeah, on yeah I think, uh, uh, of course, it was the case. So economics developed in, this, in a very unusual way for many other social sciences. One can demonstrate that. And it's still different from other social sciences in very much. And uh, this is the difficulty, this is the challenge. Uh, but I think that if we urge economists to be more realistic if we urge them to embrace uh, kind of ideas like dy dynamics, complexity and uncertainty, we have to understand that uh, we have to be realistic about economics as well. So we have to really know what happens in this powerful science, which is really powerful because economists are on top positions, especially in the United States. So what's really happening there? Who are these economists or these this, um, uh, populations is, is, of the top universities? Yeah. Right? <laughs> but is there room for diversity at, at the top? This is changing, but this is kind of... And Kate was right. I mean, there, there, there was, this is not the Samuelson era today in economics, for sure. But there is kind of, you know, there are complex tensions in uh, understanding economics when that, that you cannot really get right, always get right. For example, is economics a positive science or a normative science? And many economists would say, okay, it's not normative. We don't care what the aim is. We care about the methods to achieve it. Set us the aim, the, the aim and we get you the smartest, the smartest methods to get there. We are, I mean, we are agnostic about, we are technical, like engineers. And this is a powerful metaphor, by the way. Economists as engineers. One of the Nobel Prize winners says, okay, we're just engineers. Yeah. Is yeah. economics, another tension, is economics about every kind of human action? Is it about, is it a universal social science or is it a historically bounded social science? But is there a reason, Kate, that you decided to write a book for the general audience and so not an academic book? Because, yeah, so if, if you want to change uh, the economic science too and diversify it, shouldn't you um, preach to that audience? So why, why, um, why via the public route? Or is that something you think that is combined in your work? Because I think after the financial crisis, when uh, it wasn't just economists and universities were affected by it, everybody was affected by it, many people very personally and very harshly. Economists came forward, we all remember seeing, you know, Alan Greenspan saying, the models just didn't behave as we thought they'd behave. And I think there's a public accountability to open up this discussion in this profession then. Yeah. Also, every election, Every political party, whatever country we're in, will put forward a set of policies that are economic policies that inherently make a claim about how the economy works. And if electorates are going to feel empowered to be part of that, to choose parties on the basis of economic policies they believe in, this needs to be a wider conversation. We, I don't think we can have democracy unless more people feel the co economic conversation is accessible. Yeah. So I wanted to write... And also, I, look, as a mother, I would often be at the school gates and chatting to someone, they say, what do you do? And I, I, I'm writing a book on economics. The first thing yeah. people do is draw back. <gasps> <laughs> I, I, I was never very good at maths at school, they say, as if that's what it is. And I said, yeah. look, in my book, the only numbers are the page numbers. <laughs> and that's intentional, yeah. so that yeah. everybody can understand this. If we can only talk about economics in equations, I think something's gone wrong. Yeah. 
Yeah, but are you itching to to try and to change the economic science too? The the the, the so at, at the at the universities because you mentioned, of course, also the textbook state they use that um, that shape the way that mold the minds of these young people. You 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 told how you yourself uh, were molded in the 80s in a way that you didn't really like. Um, so is that, um, yeah, is that yeah. a, yeah. I, I, I want to see change in the universities and for yeah. me, partly what I'm, the way I'm doing it is to try and advocate to bring about that change. Yeah. I feel very closely aligned with the student movement. So the students want to be taught pluralism. They want to be taught all of the mindsets on that list, not just one. I've picked out a group. I've made a particular selection and said, I personally believe that these ways of thinking are going to be a very powerful mindset that empowers us to take on the challenges of the 21st century. The student movement say, we want to be taught those as well as others, and I think they're wise to want that. They want to be respected as critical thinkers, as yeah. you would be in history or anthropology or sociology or political science. You learn a diversity of theoretical stances, and then you, as an individual, reflect on which ones you think are most appropriate when. Yeah. In economics... And this university may be an exception, I cannot say, but in economics, that is usually not the case. You are taught neoclassical economics, this is economics, and most students don't even know there's another way. Yeah. Do you... Uh, how is that in Nijmegen? Are we... Are we doing good? We're yes. doing well? Uh, if you take this... <laughs> if you take this uh, research Kate was referring to, then they're making this the first, on the first place in pluralism oh. in the Netherlands. Congratulations. And in this sense, <laughs> of course, uh, yeah. Yeah, but are you, are you, um, how do you see the change come about? So, okay, so in Nijmegen, uh, we're doing, we're doing well. Um, well, but maybe doing better than the others. Let's do yeah. it's relative, right? <laughs> I hear mutterings in the audience. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, so we'll leave this for now. We'll we'll get into the. This is this is dangerous territory. Let's uh, let's uh, get to another stage. So the, um, um, you stress the importance of um, how how pictures work for us. Mm -hmm. How how we remember things better or more vividly or whatever. So. Um, maybe we get into that some more. How the, the so this character of the um, uh, the, the Homo economicus, so the, the autonomous rational man, um, is is this character hard to let go of? Is it itched very deep into people? Um, I think it's etched deeply into theories. Of course, behavioral economics, so what I showed the old way and the new way, and behavioral economics is one of the disciplines that is opening up a far richer notion of who humanity is, along with neuroscience and uh, sociology. We're, we're learning, and, and people are loving reading books about the richness of who we are. Homo Deus, you know, these books by Harari are telling us a new portrait of who humanity is. It's not the only one, but we're fascinated by books that tell us who we are. Yeah. That is opening up. Um, and so microeconomists might say, but we use behavioral economics all the time in our models, we've moved on, this is old, that's a straw man. But that character of rational economic man is still embedded at the heart of most macroeconomic models. So he's still there and he lives on. Yeah. And I found it, one of the most fascinating things I learned in researching the book was this impact of the model on the student mind and how over time students came more to mimic and value the attributes that lay in rational economic man. To me, that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, because Ivan, you 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 uh, you've studied uh, how the performativity of models also. So, um, so the idea of yeah, maybe tell us a bit more about how so models perform. Yeah. They don't describe; they yeah. prescribe in a way. And that's a fascinating idea, of course. And that's uh, in some sense, it's a scandalous idea. It's a scandal because I mean. Most economists would say that they don't have to do anything to do with reality in terms of in intervening. They just try to explain, to understand. Yeah. And any science, I mean, how could physics change the physical laws? Well, this is also a complex philosophical <laughs> matter. Um, but, but still, I mean, the, the, there is some kind of a natural presupposition that uh, a pos some kind of positivist idea that we are independent 
of the reality we are trying to, to Also comprehend. as economics. So as there's economics, us, economics, yeah. and then yeah. there's the reality we try yeah. to grasp in yeah. our models. The data. We're standing outside the system yeah. and we're just describing it. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. data. The data is out there and we just try to figure out what, what's happening there. Yeah. It's a very powerful idiom. Yeah. But uh, uh, the, the fascinating thing about the performativity literature, which emerged in the sociology, essentially, in, in economic sociology, uh, that uh, it's not just that uh, by education economics shapes who we are, but, uh, but also by some kind of institutional norms, by material things in which economic models are embedded somehow. It's, it's, uh, it's a f one of the stories I think you'd also tell in the book is about the black shoals uh, oh. model and uh, actually financial economists who introduced... Uh, the idea of options pricing were also those who uh, who created options markets uh, or participated essentially in creating options markets in the United States in the 1970s. So it's 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 fascinating that they cr they first they draw equations and the equations determine how the uh, equilibrium price of an option of a complex financial instrument is to be determined. Yeah, and then they prepare tables where uh, the, price or the price of an underlying asset, something you know, something you can feed into, is uh, listed, and then the, the, the resulting price of the... So you don't have to know the equation. You just have to get a table, which shows you the correct price, the price where, which, is, which is an equilibrium price. This is the equilibrium incarnate. Right. This is the embodiment of economic modeling in the physical world. Oh, and, and, yeah. and agents but then, follow but then the you rule, say so, so they, they have effects in reality, very much so, but, they, they, uh, but we are blinded to them. So that's a blind spot to us. Is, 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 that, is that it? So we are, in effect, changing reality, but we don't see it. So we need to see how this works. Would you so, say that? Absolutely. So as you said, you know, many economists will say this is a positive science. Uh, so I've been in some debates, in fact, here in the Netherlands with economists, where I say, well, on day one, I would start with the donut and say, I present this as a possible uh, goal for the economy. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. Now you've left the scholar's role. You've become an activist because you're talking about values. And economics is a value-free science. And I said, well, hang on. What do you teach on day one? You teach supply and demand. To me, that is, intentionally or not, and probably not intentionally, that's a political act. Welcome to economics. Here's the market. I mean, that centers front and center the market mechanism, the idea that price reflects value, um, and then other things that fall outside of it are called an externality. And he, he looked at me as if I was completely crazy, which actually that was the bit that disturbed me because he didn't see that the way he was teaching was framed with a worldview where we is, start is this what we changing? Draw. Is this changing so, since you started? Uh, uh, teaching about the donut and, and giving lectures on it, has that changed that people thought you were crazy and now they start to think maybe there is something to what she's saying? Well, there's always the selection bias. So the ones who think you're crazy just quietly mutter yeah. in the corner and don't tell you. Yeah. But the ones who agree say, I, I, you know, so I'm yeah. contacted by the people who agree. Yeah. Um, I find particularly high school economics teachers, and I, I, be, I don't know why, there seems to be a real difference between school teachers and university teachers. I'm... <laughs> finding many high school teachers say, oh, we really want to teach these ideas. We want to bring them in the curriculum. We want to expose our students to the breadth of this. More embracing of it than at the university level. And I don't no. know why. But no. of course, in every university, there are individuals who desperately want to widen the, what they're teaching. But they too are caught in a system of incentives and in an institution where this is the syllabus and this is the exam. So even if they want to teach about the donut, the exam is this problem set in equations. The yeah. students have to master that. And these are the journals where you get tenure if you get published here. So there's all sorts of institutional lock-in that any professor, no matter how much they want to widen it, is caught in. When I was yeah. in Belgium uh, a while ago, I was presenting these ideas, had a great discussion with about 15 university professors. Afterwards, over coffee, one of them said to me, you know, I love the ideas in your book. I really would be, I find it exciting. I'd love to teach it, but I'm on track for getting tenure. So I have to be cautious. And, and that just stuck with me. You see, he wanted to teach us, but he was institutionally felt he couldn't. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're nodding. Um... A bit more sociology of science, just to be more realistic about economics. 
<laughs> right? Uh, I think it's very right what you say about the institutional uh, incentives, etc., in, 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 in economic science. But also, this is an important thing, a very elementary thing about every science. Scientists focus on things. There are few economists in the world who can really uh, say, okay, I know what's happening in the whole of economics. Economics is very broad, very complex, with, very, with a lot of ang uh, different aspects and groups. Some of them, they don't, don't know anything about each other. My, my field is uh, an attempt to, bri to, to build bridges among different schools of economics, because I, I try to see the general picture, but that's very difficult. For example, there is the whole big, big, big debate about the notions of well-being and what is well-being in economics. Now, there are economists who are thinking about that. Yes, of course. There are economists who are uh, including the economists on the top positions of them in the mainstream. They also think about that. Amartya Sen is not the only person. Of and course. I'm, and I'm, I was happy that in your book you really quote many economists. Yes. Not just... I mean, also mainstream economists yes. who are uh, involved in this conversation. And with, they, they start thinking beyond the standard definition of economics, because the standard definition of economics does not include any no. aim. Yes, it got Any lost. kind of uh, what economy, yes. economy is for. Adam Smith had one. He defined economics around an aim for people to be able to meet their own needs and to raise enough money for the state to spend. He defined it around a name, but it got removed, I think, in the desire to make it a science that is value-free. But can I pick up on this point about, I agree with you, economists get focused, and nobody can claim to be able to speak across the whole field. But let's just compare economics and medicine, because there's a lot of similarities. Both of them deal with other people's lives. Both of them are intervening as a doctor and economist. You're intervening in a system that we don't fully understand, be it the human body or the economy. It's complex, and it has consequences for other people. So there's an, actually a responsibility of an ethics there. What is the first thing that medical students learn? They have to learn the name of every bone, every muscle, every tendon, every part of the body. They have to learn about the whole before they can become a heart surgeon. Now, when they're a heart surgeon, they know if they're going to do an operation, they have to work with an anaesthetist, they have to take, uh, pay attention and work with a team who pays attention to the rest of the body, even though that's their speciality. In economics, though, you could, because the environment is talked about as an externality, and you can go and do a special paper in that if you want to, but, you know, not all of us want to, you could become, a finance, you could become uh, the, the, the head of a, a central bank and know nothing about the economic body. So let me just... Here we are. To me, this picture, at a very simple level, is like medical students who have to learn the whole human body and recognise that the heart is one organ within many others with which it interacts. So that even when somebody becomes focused, like a heart surgeon or uh, a financial economist, they know that they have to think about it in relation to the whole. And to me, the most radical act in economics is to draw the economy in the living world and to require any macroeconomic policymaker to think about the ecological implications of the macro policy that's being made. But at the moment, you don't learn that. You can just, and none of us would go to a doctor who said, I'm a heart surgeon. I mean, I don't know anything about the digestive system or, or breathing, but you know, I'm really good at the heart. You wouldn't let them operate. So why do we allow economists who, who don't place it in the broader context to run our financial systems? Uh, uh, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe before we go to, to, to the audience and see what they have to say and ask especially, um, let's, uh, let's delve into the, the, the role of the economist. Um, just after the, the crash of 2007, um, I think I at several places um, I read something about why do we think economists are some sort of high priests or priests that tell us What's going on? As, as if, uh, so we turn to them for, for guidance. Um, and, and then I thought, yeah, if, if they get, in, get us into so much trouble, why do we seek their guidance? Why don't we turn to another discipline? So um, in your book you write, one thing is clear, economic theory will play a defining role. Economics is the mother tongue of public policy, the language of public life, and the mindset that shapes society. 
why shouldn't we do away with economists? Uh, uh, and also, why don't we... Um, why don't we go to sociologists? Why are the, is the economist so important for guidance, for leadership? Aren't we asking too much? Well, we're certainly asking too much to ask one intellectual discipline to provide us with all the policy solutions. And so also towards the end of my book, I say that the, a 21st century economist should be um, like a maypole dancer. I don't know if you do you have maypoles and dance around? Um, dancing with yeah. many other disciplines, right? Interwoven with learning from sociologists and neuroscientists and political economists because no one discipline has it all. John Maynard Keynes talked about this, you know, he said the master economist is something like mathematician, part historian, part philosopher. I wish he'd said part ecologist to have the living world in there as well. So, of course, it needs a diversity. I'm playfully saying we all need to be 21st century economists. In fact, we all are because we, all of our actions as consumers, as savers, investors, divestors, employees, CEOs, we all shape the economy if we think of it as evolving and ever-changing, bottom-up. Um, but actually, go back to the ancient Greek roots of the word. Economics means household management. Yeah. And I very much like that quote from John Maynard Keynes. What is household management in the 21st century? I think household management got captured and dominated by too narrow, too financial, short, too short-term interests. And by the way, of course, finance is power, and that's why economics will always be relevant, because power is embedded in that system, but it needs to be rewritten for the 21st century. I'd love to hear your view on that from the kind of economic and sociology point of view. Would you say, actually, let's broaden the table, either broaden economics or broaden the table of who's at the table of power? Uh, in economics, it was always very difficult for economists to converse with other disciplines. It's notoriously difficult, and it's still difficult. Uh, I think economics g got powerful, uh, first of all, because it was very easily mathematized. And you see, I mean, it was very close to kind of scientificity, uh, which physics was up to in the beginning of the 20th century, so it was, it was a historical origin. But also because e economists tend to be much more uh, focused and causal, I would say, they prefer causal, causal claims, although causal claims are, are also very difficult in science. And I mean, these this were attempts which proved to be somewhat elusive because previous research, there were di difficulties with, uh, for example, with reproducing the research done by previous economists, something also in, important in psychology. So there is, there is the problem of, of, of uh, arriving at some firm causal claims, partly because the economies are changing. Economies are changing. The, the, the subject matter is not stable. It's changing, and you are always, you're tr you're always late, in a sense. <laughs> you're always trying to keep up with the ever-changing economy. And that's, of course, a challenge for uh, economists. But they got very powerful in mastering certain methods and tools. Yes. And you, if you want, you, you, you mention your book, the kind of, you know, storming the citadel or something like this. This so is trying what the students to, say. Or this is yes. what the students say. If they want to do that, they have to understand that economics was very much obsessed and remains to be obsessed with kinds of methods, both formal modeling and of, of empirical uh, uh, analysis of empirical data. They, they always try to perfect for some kind of aim, but that's, that's a difficult story. But uh, this is, this is what, what, how e economics got powerful mm. among the social scientists, and that's why they don't want to hear other social sciences. They dismiss all kind of echosal, interpretive, historical and that's what I should types of to. argument. And that's a serious yeah. epistemological, it's an epistemological problem. It's yeah. the problem of what knowledge is about, what knowledge of society is about. Is it causal, or is it historical or is it narrative is it more interpretive that's the tensions which are not which exist now not only in economics but in political science sure, as well sure. in, even in sociology in some parts of sociology in history where the quantitative history is emerging mm -hmm. suddenly historians see that okay there are people who try to figure it out with graphs and formulas etc and there's this is a huge problem of communication which is around yeah mm -hmm.